Good evening, everyone. I'm Lisa Krasner, the Edward W. Kane Executive Director at the Concord Museum, and thank you to our Concord community, our friends, members, volunteers, board leadership, and staff who are with us on this very special night, both in person as well as virtually. We knew within the first day of posting this forum online that we would need a much larger venue than the Museum's Lyceum, and we are so very grateful to the Fenn School for their hospitality and collaboration, so thank you so much. It's a tremendous honor to introduce tonight's forum, which is a reading and conversation with poets Robert Pinsky and Gail Mazur. Robert Kin Pinsky is a poet, essayist, translator, teacher, and speaker. Throughout his career, Pinsky has been dedicated to identifying and invigorating poetry's place in the world. Pinsky is the author of 19 books, most of which are collections of his poetry. His work has earned him the Penn Volcker Award, the William Carlos Williams Prize, the Lenore Marshall Prize, Italy's Premio Capri, the Korean Manhe Award, and the Harold Washington Award from the city of Chicago, among other accolades. Pinsky served as the United States Poet Laureate from 1997 to 2000. His first two terms as Poet Laureate were marked by such visible dynamism and such national enthusiasm and response that the Library of Congress appointed him to an unprecedented third term. As part of his work as Poet Laureate, Pinsky founded the Favorite Poem Project, in which thousands of Americans of varying backgrounds, all ages, and from every state, share their favorite poems. This project's resulting anthology is in its 18th printing. Pinsky often performs his poems with eminent jazz musicians. So next time we do this, we'll get some jazz musicians. Uh, always seeking to bring poetry to a broad audience, Pinsky is the only member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters to have appeared on both The Simpsons and The Colbert Report. For years, a regular contributor to PBS's NewsHour, he publishes frequently in magazines such as The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, The Three Penny Review, and the Best American Poetry Anthologies, a popular series for which he has also served as editor of the 25th anniversary volume. An award-winning educator, Pinsky is a professor of English and creative writing in the graduate writing program at Boston University. In 2015, the university named him a William Fairfield Warren Distinguished Professor, the highest honor bestowed on senior faculty members. Tonight, Pinsky will read from his recently published memoir, Jersey Breaks, Becoming an American Poet. Writer Megan O'Rourke says, in his gripping memoir, Robert Pinsky chronicles his Jewish American upbringing in New Jersey and, show, and shows how it led him to poetry, vividly illuminating a disappearing time and place in America and shining a light on what it means to be a poet. At once expansive and lyrical, historically significant and deeply intimate, Jersey Break tells an unforgettable story. Joining Robert Pinsky in conversation this evening is his friend and award-winning poet, Gail Major. Major has published numerous collections of poetry, including They Can't Take That Away From Me, a finalist for the National Book Award. Her work has been recognized as a winner of the Mass Massachusetts Book Prize and finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the Patterson Poetry Prize. Her poems have been widely anthologized, including in several Pushcart Prize anthologies, The Best American Poetry, and Robert Pinsky's Essential Pleasures. A graduate of Smith College, Mazur has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Bunting Institute of Radcliffe College, and the Radcliffe Institute. She was for 20 years distinguished senior writer in residence in Emerson's college graduate program, and now teaches in Boston University's MFA program in creative writing, and at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, where she has served for many years on the writing committee. In 1973, Mazur founded the Blacksmith House Poetry Series in Harvard Square, which became, with its weekly readings, a center of poetry life, bringing national and international writers to read in a lovely and formal atmosphere. As an activist with her late husband, the artist Michael Mazur, and other artists, Massachusetts writers and artists, she co-founded in 1968 Artists Against Racism in the War, and later they were activists for a nuclear freeze. Back, Blacksmith House presented benefit readings for, among other issues, the fight for AIDS research. So following the forum tonight, uh, Robert Pinsky will be signing copies of Jersey Breaks, along with other collections of his poetry. The books are available for purchase thanks to our partners at the Concord Bookshop. So you can please exit through the main lobby to pick up books and have them signed after the talk. And please join me in welcoming Robert Pinsky and Gal Mazur. Thank you very much, Lisa. I'm grateful to the Concord Museum 
uh, for inviting me to talk to you, and I'm uh, truly grateful to you all for coming out to listen to me. Uh, the plan is that the poet I admire immensely, Gail Mazur, uh, will uh, guide us through a Q&A after I talk to you and read to you a little bit for about half an hour now. Maybe I'll start with a bit of a quibble about what this book is categorized as. I'm very aware that memoir is the retail category and that for the publisher, this is a memoir. I have asked myself, why do I call it an autobiography in my own mind? I think there is a sort of, uh, if it's not too self-effacing or mock modest, there's a kind of a preacher quality in me. I wanted this book to not simply be a collection of Robert Pinsky's coolest memories or my best stories. Maybe I'll do that book someday. I hope this is not boring. It does have stories in it. But I wanted to respond to the question the book begins with. The book is dedicated to my dear friend, I still grieve, for Jill Neerum, the best literary agent I ever encountered, probably one of the best ones that ever lived. And Jill gave me the subject for this book in a subtle sort of narrative social way. She said, Robert, you ought to write a book that explains how it is that you became a poet rather than a criminal or an optometrist. <laughs> Maybe the funniest line in the book, and it's the first one, and I quote it from Jill. I then go on to say, to use a word I just used a second ago, I could quibble. My father, Milford Pinsky, was an optician, not an optometrist. A common mistake. And it's true that his father, Dave Pinsky, was a criminal. Indicted, it, I, I quote the New, Newark Daily News saying, these people indicted involved the largest illegal still operation in the history of the state of New Jersey. That's not Nebraska. That's in the history of New Jersey. But as my Aunt Thelma used to say, her pop was in the liquor business, and it happened to be during Prohibition. <laughs> Zadie Pop, as I called him, pursued the liquor business in our hometown of Long Branch, New Jersey. And the part of Long Branch that I lived in we did a program about this book at the Harvard Bookstore, and my friend, the very eminent sociologist, Orlando Patterson, noted that it was a very brief moment in American culture and history. I lived, you could say, on the border between a neighborhood of poor white people and a neighborhood of poor black people. They intersected a bit. Rockwell Avenue in my day was all white, mostly Jewish, Italian, Irish. Monmouth Avenue was nearly all black, though there was my family, friends, the Fishers, there was a Jewish junkyard and residence on Monmouth. At the far end of Monmouth Avenue was the Tally Ho Tavern, where in a local legend, someone had once in an altercation bitten the finger of a policeman off. At our end of Monmouth Avenue, across the street from the house where we had an apartment, was Dr. Julius McKelvey, MD, who I learned years later, many years later, was active in the early years of the NAACP. He tried unsuccessfully to integrate get this to integrate
the Atlantic Ocean. Of the 20 or so beaches in Long Branch, only one was where black people could swim. The conviction underlying the book is that American social problems, our country's political problems, all of that that we see in the news cannot be dealt with successfully without attention to American culture. That American culture with its contradictions and defects and its great accomplishments, notably, I would say, jazz music and the other descendants of the blues, jazz, hip hop, all of it comes from that mixed, essentially mixed, partly African, partly Caribbean, European marching band instruments. Appalachian survives of its own Celtic things. And that other mix, that preposterous successful mix, the American feature film. And then our poetry and fiction by Herman Melville and Ralph L. Ellison, Emily Dickinson. In there somewhere, the point of the book is, I was growing up there and what Orlando Patterson says was the brief moment between, before redlining got to be perfected by the real estate industry. So I grew up in a false paradise of an integrated neighborhood. And in a story that I may not have time to get to in the book, my father a successful high school athlete. He and I not only went to the same high school, we had the same home teacher. <laughs> Miss Scott. Maybe she got always that same part of the alphabet. He, in his graduating class, was voted best looking boy. I was voted my most musical boy. And as I say in the book, he deserved his title far better than he deserved. <laughs> He got a job as an optician working for an optometrist when he was in high school. And when I was seven years old, he still had that same job and then he got fired from it. So there was severe economic pressure. They were living with a third child in a little two-bedroom apartment in a multi-family frame house in that neighborhood. I'll pick up the narrative when I'm in college. I was in the jazz band, more practically in the marching band, which released me from carrying a rifle in the Reserve Officers Training Corps, which was required back then in all state universities. Every state university in the country, that also is a piece of social history. If you went to Amherst or Harvard, you didn't have to be in the ROTC. If you went to Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, it was required for two years in order to give the actual serious people who wanted to be officers somebody to order around. <laughs> I avoided a lot of that by, instead of a rifle, carrying my Buchard aristocrat saxophone. And I wound up in a section of major British writers that was mostly all for uh, athletes because I had band practice at the same time that they had uh, sports practice. I don't mean to stereotype the athletes. Some of them were impressive writers and readers, but in that class, I shone, and I knew it. <laughs> Worse, I was pretentious enough and naive enough to show that I knew it. The teacher, Maurice Charney, gave me extra assignments like writing a parody of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland in the style of Raymond Chandler. <laughs> to take me gently down a notch, maybe to amuse himself, Charney one day asked me with a straight face, have I ever read Ulysses by James Joyce? Um, I don't think so, sir. 
I had never heard of the author of the book, but I got a copy from the library. It confused me. <laughs> On the first page, one character emerges from something called the stairhead to join others in a tower. Somebody leans on something called a gun rest. Maybe they were soldiers at war. Somebody who talks a lot in those first pages is wearing a thing called a dressing gown while holding a shaving ball. Those mysterious objects, like Joyce's cloud of literary references, bewildered me in an exciting way. But I loved Ulysses as a book about lower middle class people in a community. For me, it was a book about New Jersey and the Jersey Shore. Years later, I recognized that feeling when I read it in an interview with Gabriel Garcia Marquez. He says, the best South American novel, the best South American novel ever written, says Marquez, is The Hamlet by William Faulkner. <laughs> I was in particular, I was in particular affected by Joyce's autobiographical character, Stephen Dedalus, who says, asked for a definition of history, says history is the nightmare from which I am trying to awake. History is the nightmare from which I am trying to awake. Those words of Joyce's priggish, arrogant, young alter ego became a guide for me. In the personal canon that I began to improvise, Elizabeth Bishop, Isaac Bobble, William Shakespeare, Ralph Ellison, Emily Dickinson, Franz Kafka, Alan Dugan, Sophocles, and Mark Harris dealt with history as a nightmare and the struggle through art to wake up from it. In my heart of a newly minted highbrow, I adored the story of Stephen Dedalus and Leopold <coughs> Bloom and their shared journey in history and maybe out of it. I recognized the journey the way I recognized Dublin as a version of Long Branch, New Jersey. Closer to home, I read the poetry of William Carlos Williams, beginning with the mixed and mixed up immigrant cultures of his New Jersey. I understood why Williams made his tangled family history defy understanding. He wrote it so that it would not be easy to understand. In a tribute to his grandmother, dedicated for a, the dedication for a plot of ground, I read that poem and I knew immediately how the incomprehensibility is the point. It reminded me of being a child listening to my aunts and uncles, even more my great aunts and great uncles, talking about the family history. Well, yeah, his second wife did not come with him, so then there was the other wife, but the kid from the first marriage married the Margolis cousin. The Margolis cousin, not Bernie Margolis, Eddie Margolis. <laughs> the child was going, I'll read you from Dedication for a Plot of Ground by William Carlos Williams. This plot of ground, it's a tribute to his grandmother, Emily Dickinson Welcome. Dedication for a Plot of Ground. This plot of ground facing the waters of this inlet is dedicated to the living presence of Emily Dickinson Welcome, who was born in England, married, lost her husband, and with her five-year-old son sailed for New York in a two-master, was driven to the Azores, ran adrift on Fire Island Shoal, met her second husband in a Brooklyn boarding house, went with him to Puerto Rico, bore three more children, lost her second husband, lived hard for eight years in St. Thomas, Puerto Rico, San Domingo, followed the eldest son to New York, lost her daughter, lost her baby, seized the two boys of the oldest son by the second marriage. Isn't that great? <laughs> seized the two boys of the oldest son by the second marriage, mothered them. They being motherless, fought for them against the other grandmother and the aunts. At that point, I say, this poem's disorderly narrative of disorder, with its broken families, forced emigrations, and contentious relatives, 
was exactly the kind of jumbled story I heard from my aunts and uncles, and I consider it the great American story. It's not enough to say we're a, a country of immigrants. We're a country of fucked up immigrants. <laughs> Confused, distorted, stubborn, resolute, and somewhat adulterous, or at least multi-colored. <laughs> I'll read the rest of the poem. They being my fork them against the other grandmother and the ants brought them here summer after summer, defended herself here against thieves, storms, sun, fire, against flies, against girls that came smelling about, against the crowd, against weeds, storm tides, neighbors, weasels that stole her chickens, against the weakness of her own hands, against the growing strength of the boys, against wind, against the stones, against trespassers, against rents, against her own mind. She grubbed this earth with her own hands, domineering over this grass plot, blackguarded her oldest son into buying it, lived here 15 years, attained a final loneliness and if you can bring nothing to this place but your carcass, keep out. <laughs> I love that two-syllable, demonic, colloquial American expression, keep out. Overriding every mere election, underlying every national abomination or achievement, I feel the tremendous compacted force, call it nuclear, of that enigmatic, idealized duality of democratic culture. What would such a culture be? Clearly, it would be blended. As Williams intuited early on, as a young writer tinkering with his name, he signed his first book, William C. Williams. After that, he seriously considered using W.C. Williams. Then finally, he decided on who he became defined by the almost comically ordinary and similar first name and last name, William Williams, on either side, escorting between them the central Carlos. The name is the more American because it is a hybrid, impure, implying an immigrant story, the aspiration for a new mixed democratic culture. I try to, uh, in my inexpert way, comment on that a little more. The Tally Ho Tavern once advertised an exotic dancer named Little Egypt. The poster of Little Egypt's picture impressed me. At the age of 11, I understood that the word Egypt involved the remote past. I didn't know that for a hundred years, dozens of American dancers of different races, mostly strippers or belly dancers, had been billed as Little Egypt. By the time I was 12, we had moved away from Rockwell Avenue and the Tyler Tavern to Woolley Avenue near the high school. The two words, Little Egypt, made a thrilling combination of the familiar and the unknown. Sex was only part of it. Years later, the coasters had a hit song called Little Egypt, covered by Elvis Presley. <coughs> she did the hoochie coochie real slow, sang the coasters, with the lever and stoller lyrics using another 19th century phrase, the hoochie coochie. Part of an ongoing effort with the racial divide only the largest, clearest fracture. Could our public education, our vital public education, and our popular culture hold us together in that effort? That would depend upon our works of art, I decided. Still that much of a Stephen Dedalus loyalist. Adaptation, as distinct from waking up, or the form of waking up, replace that idea somewhat 
public nightmare from which I have to awake. Adaptation as distinct from waking up or a form of waking up. That idea helps me think about real life quirks and paradoxes, Monmouth Avenue, with Little Egypt and Dr. Julius McKelvey at the different opposite ends of that short street. I can't pretend to analyze its history beyond a misty, almost erotic or silly sense of begats. The English class system begat dissenting Protestant settlers who begat profit and enterprise, and profit and enterprise begat settlers, and settlers begat colonialism, genocide, and slavery. Slavery begat field chance and lynching, and field chance begat the blues, and the blues begat Duke Ellington, and Duke Ellington begat Ella Fitzgerald and John Coltrane, and Stan Getz playing Bra Brazilian rhythms with Astrugio Belto. And the Borscht Belt begat Margaret Cho and Chris Rock. Lynching begat the Southern strategy of the Republicans. European emigration begat nostalgic yearning. And nostalgic yearning begat opera houses. And opera houses begat vaudeville. And vaudeville begat four-year-old Buster Keaton's father throwing his athletic little child around the stage. And East Coast entrepreneurs begat Hollywood. And Hollywood begat Bollywood. Long after it begat the grown-up Buster Keaton. And the grown-up Buster Keaton begat Jackie Chan years after he begat Sid Caesar and Imogene Coca and Sid Caesar, etc. <laughs> and I try to look at democratic culture as something that embraces things like Ellen and Keaton are now curated, protected by universities. The Library of Congress has to decide which commercials are worth preserving forever. And it is up to us to decide. And in the process of sorting through culture, in my own quarter of poetry, the favorite poem project, if you go to the videos, as I hope you will, favoritepoem.org, you will not see poets reading poems. You will not see actors reading poems. You will not see professors or critics discussing poems. You will see a construction worker read lines by Walt Whitman and have very cogent comments about them. You will see a Jamaican immigrant man read Sylvia Plath's Nick in the Candy State. The idea, an ideal, is not to compromise intellectual standards or aesthetic standards at all. Not to dumb anything down. People are kind when they say, oh, I advocate for poetry. No, poetry doesn't need advocates. It would be like advocating for dance or cuisine. What it would be <coughs> beyond appropriation. It's absolutely fundamental. The goal is to recognize and understand the nature of the art in American culture, and I think those videos do that. Um, I will, believe me, I do tell personal stories. I, uh, I describe my early reading. I go into Ivanhoe and how much I loved Knights. And I read and reread Mark Twain's A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. The book mocked the old European parties and hierarchies while also making them fascinating. Plain's King Arthur was a jerk, but genuinely noble. I finished the book and began reading it again from page one the way I read and reread the Alice books or Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. At the age of 11, from the limited perspective of Long Branch, in the middle of the 20th century, in a family where I heard Yiddish every day, I pondered the attachment of Ivanhoe, the knightly Saxon, fighting the Slav dominant uh, Normans, his, uh, Ivanhoe's devotion to the Jew named Isaac of Monmouth, played by the British, British actor Felix Elmer. I puzzled over the name Isaac of Monmouth, not Goldberg or Shapiro or Pinsky. Or Monmouth. Long Branch is in Monmouth County. I lived around the corner from 
Mama's Avenue. And then I go into name changes and many American name changes. Sometimes the names of poets, like Herbert, Sidney, Milton. And I go into Marguerite Roberts, who wrote the screenplay for the film, Spartacus, in which the name Spartacus is quite important. So the book is subtitled Becoming an American Poet. I've tried to give you the impetus of that. The second half of the book includes my being surprised to find that I've gotten recognition. Other people are calling me an American poet. I win prizes. I get extremely good job. My father and his friends would say, Robert, they paid what? <laughs> you do what? <laughs> the favorite poem project was an attempt, like many things I do, an attempt to do something productive and are honorable with that unexpected titles and so forth. I'll read from the last 10 pages or so of the book. Instead of the cliche, you'll have to read it to see how it comes out. You'll have to read it to see how I got from that beginning. To this <laughs> I talk about the idea of New Jersey break, local breaks. I talk about my father's college career. My dad went to college for uh, almost two weeks it was Monmouth Junior College, and uh, for his first assignment, he wrote a definition. His definition was a definition of what is a gentleman. And he said, a gentleman is someone who is more concerned with the well-being of others than himself. The teacher in that junior high school class, junior college class, asked Milford Pinsky to please stay, and he said, where did you copy this? <laughs> I said, no, I didn't copy it, I wrote it. He said, this is plagiarism, and as my father tells it, he was so insulted, he never went back again. The story is interesting to me, because it involves that idea of a journey. the idea that in the American democracy, everybody is royal. We are the ruling class. In theory, the people are the ruling class. And my father, in his own way, was asserting that he was ruling class. Who I mean, he had a lot of reasons to drop out. It was the Depression. Uh, but he says he never went back again because the guy insulted him. In the favorite poem project, the variety of readers, the variety of poems, the unpredictable quality of who would select which poem, all, I believe, express an elegant, embracing weirdness in American culture. The videos often present social and political realities, immigration, slavery, public education, wars, languages, degrees and kinds of assimilation, I don't see that these terms, assimilation and appropriation, somewhere in the book I say, I know what people mean by them. I prefer breaking and entering. <laughs> Presenting indictment and shame along with plenty to admire, the project is in a hopeful, unresolved sense of the word, patriotic. Underlying the assumption that there are lots of people in our country who love great poems, there's a kind of covert audience along with an egalitarian optimism. The idea of a democratic culture where great poetry appeals to many soldiers, many readers, like my father's interest in the word gentleman, is aspirational. The reader Michael Lithgow, the, the videos make me recall Ralph Ellison's distinction 
about ancestors and relatives. When the Cambodian American high school student in California reads Langston Hughes's Minstrel Man, she chooses Hughes as her ancestor as he helps her think about Cambodia. The reader Michael Lithgow, a veteran of the war in Vietnam, is probably about the same age as Yusuf Komanyaka. Though Lithgow lived in Washington, D.C., he had avoided the Memorial Wall until he agree, agreed for us to film him reading Komanyaka's poem there. In many other videos, of course, the answer is to Lithgow, white man, makes his contemporary Yusuf his ancestor. In many other videos, of course, the ancestor is also, in Ellison's figurative sense of the two words, a relative. The Connecticut high school teacher, Laisma Perez Silva, gives a powerful reading in English and in Spanish of Julio de Burcos' poem, Ay, Ay, Ay de la Grifa Negra. In the video, we see Perez Silva interact with her students, many of them, but not all, Spanish-speaking and black. Laisma, their teacher, explained she stayed in Connecticut rather than returning to her birthplace, Puerto Rico, because of her mission among those students. Dr. Lin Ai's head note for The Way of the Water, Hyacinth, explaining why he selected that poem, is well written in an alliterative way. He says the water Hyacinth embodies the Burmese people. He writes, because it is bent, because of its bent, its bite, because it's Burmese, because it's Buddhist, Buddhist, because it's beautiful. In one of the more recent videos, healthcare worker Emilio Aponte Sierra identifies himself as a refugee. He chooses to read Antonio Machado's Caminante no hay camino. Explaining his attachment to that poem, Ponte Sierra acknowledges he did not come to the United States because he dreamed of coming here. Right-wing forces in Colombia threatened his life because of his work with poor and rural, rural people there. So he became a refugee, hoping to catch a break. At the end of the video, he relates the poem to his own personal understanding of the American dream, not to be rich or successful, but to start from zero and, quote, make my own path to stay alive. Near the end of the video, he reads Machado's poem in Spanish. Caminante, en tus huellos el camino, y nada más. Caminante, no hay camino. Se hace camino al andar. Al andar se hace el camino, y al volver la vista atrás. Se ve la sende que nunca Se da a volver a pisar, a volver a pisar. Caminante, no hay camino, sino estelas en la mar. We hear him read those words while we see him walk on the Florida beach with the man he loves. In the closing words of the video, he tells us every time he reads Machado's poem, he finds something new. Earlier in this segment, he reads the poem in a good English translation by Mary Bird and Dennis Maloney. Traveler, your footprints are the only road, nothing else. Traveler, there is no road. You make your own path as you walk. As you walk, you make your own road, and when you look back, you see the path you will never travel again. Traveler, there is no road, only a ship's wake on the sea. Of course, the English words travel and road with their separate roots cannot recover the poetic effect of caminante and camino. You don't say road go, there's no road. The fact is in the nature, in, that fact is in the nature of poetry and of languages, and of these two specific languages. In Machado's poem, Spanish uses the single root caminar for the road and the traveler. English, the tongue of a much traveled invaded island, then of an empire, combines many different roots in the translation of the poem. Traveler reaches back to the Anglo-Norman French speech of the oppressive conquerors of Ivanhoe, the novel and movie that impressed me as a child. Road, with its dramatic Scandinavian roots, comes from the language of Walter Scott's noble underdogs, the Saxons, 
including Ivanhoe, who protected the Jew Isaac of Monmouth and his beautiful daughter, played by Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> the vowels and consonants in the different sentence shapes of meaning are unique, unique each time, unique to each language and to each person. Different though Emilio Aponte Sierra and I are in many ways, we both appreciate Antonio Machado's poem. Written in the language of Pontesiera knew from birth, and that I studied with my teacher, football coach Armando Epolito, the child of Italian immigrants and a classmate of Sylvia Pinsky's, the child of immigrants from Poland and Romania. These connections, by language and blood, by exile, desperation, chance, and hallowed custom, forgotten or remembered, can be denied or affirmed, or both and all as I attempt in my poem, Samurai Song, inspired by a Japanese poem I heard read at a favorite poem reading in Kansas. The poem, in a way, denies need by making a catalog of needs. Absence can be a form of presence, <coughs> is the idea. I'm now reading that poem and the final paragraph of the book. Samurai Song. When I had no roof, I made audacity my roof. When I had no supper, my eyes died. When I had no eyes, I listened. When I had no ears, I thought. When I had no thought, I waited. When I had no father, I made care my father. When I had no mother, I embraced order. When I had no friend, I made quiet my friend. When I had no enemy, I opposed my body. When I had no temple, I made my voice my temple. I have no priest. My tongue is my choir. When I have no means, fortune is my means. When I have nothing, death will be my fortune. Need is my type. Detachment is my strategy. When I had no lover, I courted my sleep. You may proclaim independence by invoking dependence in its different forms, from parents, through temple and choir, to the lover, and to the end. As you continue on your path through presences and absences, you make a path to your destination. When you look back, you can see the path you will never travel again, a subsiding marker like the wake of a ship. Shall I speak? Can I be heard? Did you hear, Gail? Is mine working? Can you hear me? Okay. I think you're I, can, I can't. I can't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the problem. <laughs> when did you conceive this book? Because I've known you so long, and this New Jersey story is, is so much your story. It, and it's so American, and it's an American story that hasn't been done. I think a lot of people are tired of hearing about Long Branch. About what? About Long Branch, my hometown. From you, you mean? One of the beautiful Winslow Homers at the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston is called Long Branch. Society, high society, went to uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and Saratoga Springs, New York. The actors and the patent medicine millionaires and the people who eventually became the new American aristocracy 
the rich and famous, they went to Long Branch. Grant loved it, raised his horses there. So in a way, the book began in all the Long Branch storytellers, including my dad and his dad and their friends. Um, and then it really did become a book when my agent, the great John Durham, said, write a book explaining how you, as you became a poet, rather than an optician or a criminal. And it was, in many ways, more likely that I would become, as Jill put it in her ignorance, an optometrist or a criminal. Well, I, for one, <laughs> am, am happy to, that, that you're not an optometrist or an optician. People with vision problems have a lot of reason to be grateful for that. They should be grateful, <laughs> right, right. But you did work for one. I was an apprentice optician for my dad for years when I was in college. I would drive home, and I would drive, for a while I was driving home to play the saxophone and, and everything, <laughs> but mostly to work for my dad uh, in selling eyeglasses. Do, do you ever think of this as your Edenic story? Because it is, in a way. I try in my writing generally and in life, something is always reminding me not to make anything too pure. So Edenic makes something in me want to say, yes, a lot of it is also infernal or blighted. So yes. Well, that's, that, that's, that's an inf infernal Eden. I couldn't wait to get out of Long Branch, New Jersey. <laughs> And I spent my life thinking about it. Right. You know, <laughs> Dubliners is the work of an exile from Dublin. Not to be grandiose and compare myself to Joyce, but um, the most interesting writing about places, like the Hamlet, and uh, like Hundred Years of Solitude, the most interesting writing about places includes the nightmare as right. well as the Eden. Right. But, but it is interesting that when it's the place of your childhood, it can be the nightmare and the Eden, and it can't not be. It's in great American films. Right. And uh, your... Preston um, Sturgis's uh, Miracle of Morgan's Creek. Yeah. It's a beautiful little town, rather like in Hitchcock's uh, Shadow of the Doubt. They're beautiful little places. And lethal. And your, your story also has this, um, this class structure with the wealthy summer people in addition to everything yes, else. Long Branch was a summer resort. And, uh, of presidents. Still, it took me a long time to get used to going to the Cape. Because <laughs> I grew up. Look, <laughs> now, now they, I asked them. <laughs> Am I, am I okay? How's this? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I was just discussing the Boston Celtics. <laughs> for, for those of you who missed it. Um, but I feel in, in a certain way that you've been, you've been going to write this book for decades. Yes. With, and this is an incredibly prolific, great poet who also is a great critic. You know, so it was I was genuinely surprised to go back to now very big, impressive Mammoth University, which somehow transformed from that little the junior college my father went to, the classes met in the same high school he and I went to. Somehow Mammoth is now vast. It took over the beautiful Shadow Lawn, Guggenheim estate, and I was genuinely surprised to find the, a very, very big audience there uh, as a result of this wow. book. Wow. Um, I think that when you have, uh, when you've had a lot of failure in a place, it tends to be your assumption about your role there. Well, also I remember reading years ago that the, the Edenic in a certain way is the, created by the child's view, so that children playing in the rubble of the London streets during the war were happily 
playing in the streets as if yeah. it were no war. The story of the original Eden is something went wrong. <laughs> it was perfect, but something went wrong. Temptation reared It was the dead. snake's fault. Mm -hmm. And dot, dot, dot. <laughs> How did, how did Whose snake was that, God? <laughs> <laughs> how, did, how did the work of writing this book compare to other nonfiction, non-poetry books? Prose always feels kind of temporary to me. Temporary? I, if I pick up, as I'm reading to you all from this book, Part of my mind is rewriting every sentence. Mm -hmm. Prose never feels finished. I always think I could do that better. I read the poem to you. I'm aware that perhaps God could make it better. I have no feeling I need to. I did the best I could. The, the degree of physical intensity in a poem, it's like sandpapering something and you feel it and it is now done. You, you finished. And prose never quite gets there. I think this book, more than anything else I've written, has a little of that quality. But I still, when I read it, I start rewriting it as I read it. It, it is your story. It is my story, yes. Uh, and I, as I said at the beginning to you all, it's more my story because I try to make it reflective of ideas about democracy, right. money, uh, culture. It wouldn't be my story if I just made it The Adventures of Robert. Right. That's right. not who I am. Well, e everything, everything that you saw and you observed, your observant little self even, go, goes into make, went into making you yeah, I guess I've always been very aware of manners and social class. Right. A section I didn't read to you was about my great, uh, my great freshman composition teacher, Paul Fussell. He decided to teach an honors class of bright little squirts at the State University. And many of us published books. The black poet Henry Dumas, it was like one of those war movies. It was a platoon. We had the Filipino Robert Manicus, professor at UCLA now, Peter Najarian, who writes about Armenian life. Uh, it was an unusual group. Attached to the group was Alan Schuess, uh, my dear friend who died, uh, who was the reviewer for National Public Radio. And Fussell was a snob. As I say in the book, uh, he claimed that whenever anybody said to him, have a nice day. He always, said, he always said, thank you, but I have other plans. <laughs> <laughs> he was a rich boy. He says he was very grateful. He wrote very well about war. He says he was grateful uh, for basic training. He became an infantry lieutenant. It was the first time in his life he had met people who worked for a living. So... Um, I think we, working class students of his, benefited from his agony seeing people, including the sergeant who brought the young upper class officer along, that sergeant died more or less in Fussell's arms. And I think his feelings about the war, we had no idea, I didn't know he'd been wounded in the war, I didn't know any of that. Mm -hmm. But I think that was part of his motivation for making himself a good teacher of us. Do you? Um, I said much more interesting things when my mic wasn't working. <laughs> oh, no, that was really There's been a, a fallout. <laughs> I just, I wondered if you wanted to say anything about poem jazz as long as I've got you here. Music is a theme in the book. Uh, on September 9th at BUR's City Space Theater in Com Ave, I'm going to perform, I guess it's called Spoken Word. I'm a non-singing vocalist. 
I'll be with Stan Strickland, Catherine Bent, wonderful pianist Lawrence Hobgood, and the great Afro-Cuban hand percussionist Mino Sibelu. I do this sometimes, and uh, I'm going to be in a studio doing it tomorrow, and we're going to try to produce something for that event. But that performance will be uh, that night, Saturday night, September 9th. And I wouldn't dream of saying to you all that there's a curse on people who don't go. <laughs> it, it probably would be fine. But you were making music in, in your teens. My f in my teens, that was and my you main had a green ambition. Piano. As I said, yes, yeah, I've written a lot about having been a teenage musician. In the book, I presented, as I think correctly, as trying to hide from what was actually the art I was made for. And it was easier to do something I was not as good at, but could get by at. I told you, in my graduating class, I was certainly not voted most literary boy. I was voted the most musical boy. If kids were dancing at lunchtime, I was there blowing my horn. <laughs> Pinsky, Pinsky the truant, Pinsky, Pinsky the flag. I, I don't get Yeah. Should we ask? <laughs> should we ask people? Yeah. Think? Are there any you questions? Wanna, yes, sir. You should probably stand up to speak. You yeah, built it out. So I was curious about what you said about um, meeting really dying to get out of town, and then you were talking about other poets who were really exiles, and uh, not many people know you as you know uh, Dante as much as you can. Yes. Not many people understand Dante as well as you do, and I'm wondering if you can talk about exile of Dante and how you related to that. So Dante wrote as an exile. And his city, there's no, the strongest feeling of home is for the city at that time. For him to be exiled from Florence, unjustly accused of betraying his city, the, the temptation to be self-destructively angry and resentful doubtless motivated the Commedia. And fortunately, it is a very syncretic work. So things I say about American cultures being impure and mixed, that was Dante's imagination. And uh, I approached it as a craftsman. As I say about it in my preface to the Inferno of Dante, it's not a feat of scholarship. It's a feat of metrical engineering. <laughs> I created a, a terza rima in which I use fewer words. It's faster than any other translation, verse or prose. Wherever else I do right or wrong, I understood that part of his art was how quickly he can move from song to exclamation, to dialogue, to uh, lyric, to uh, analysis. And he just Terzarim is very suited to that. Thank you. Other questions? Since you're in Concord, I wonder if you found any inspiration from Emerson. The question is, since I'm in Concord, whether I have any inspiration from Emerson. Uh, I resisted Emerson almost all my life. <laughs> um, he is such an animating figure of all American literature and I heard a recent talk about Buddhist thought. Where did Emerson find out about Buddhist thought and Eastern thought? Uh, where did, a lot of these sources were French translations from Japanese. And Emerson's actual essays, they almost attract me more than I want to be attracted because they so benignly divigate and wander my soul is more intuitively responsive to Twain. Um, somewhat derisive, restless, not divigational, but uh, narrative, gossipy. I understand that Emerson is a great writer, 
and central to American thought. I understand all that. But unlike many, many people I know, Emerson and Thoreau have never seemed like the voice I want to emulate. I'd rather be resistant as Twain was, <laughs> for good or ill, and probably some of each. Music is a, which of, the root of poetry. Uh, I'll start with the second question. Yes, music is the root of poetry. Ezra Pound was a terrible human being in almost every way. He was really an awful person. <laughs> he said many good things about poetry. Pound says, music begins to atrophy if it gets too far from dance. Poetry begins to atrophy if it gets too far from music. For me, Poetry is a physical, a bodily art. It uses the melodies of, so people always talk about rhythm, there's melodies of sentences. It isn't only rhythm, it is, pitch is very important. And to hear pitch, to hear the consonants is kind of, and then the consonants chopping the vowels into meanings, that's what the art is to get the melodies of the sentences and uh, a kind of uh, the feeling of the vowels and the consonants shaping them in ways that feel right but not predictable. I'm, I'm feeling, uh, I was, okay, let's definitely keep going, but Lisa had warned us that, uh, especially because of the web element, after an hour, um, something happened, I don't know, it's like Eden, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, my question is, where did it be in the last? So, given your New Jersey roots and your love of music and its influence on you, has uh, your fellow New Jersey and uh, Bruce Springsteen, and with his lyrics in particular, being a form of poetry, considered by many of his fans, had any influence on any of your work? The interesting thing is that I have had an influence on Bruce. <laughs> if you, I'm not joking. It's mutual, but if you go to YouTube and you search for Pinsky Springsteen, you'll see a show that we did together. I have a tremendous admiration for Bruce. His autobiography is wonderfully written. It's very good. He uses the basis for the Broadway show. I was impressed, and you know, I'm partly joking, I'm being a wise guy, but Bruce knew my work at least as well as I know his. He had thought about it. And you'll see that if you look at the uh, videos of that show. Uh, I told him one thing before we began. I mean, backstage I said, one thing I will not do, Bruce, is I will not sing. <laughs> and uh, in the middle of him playing and singing Promised Land. He said, come on, Robert, on the refrain. And his nickname is The Boss. <laughs> so it's the first time I sang in public uh, in about, uh, I don't know, 80 or 90 years. I never heard that story. <laughs> I did not make it up. I believe you. I always believe him. And you should, too. Yeah. So um, as a... This is not your first book of prose. No. But it's very different. But in a way, I feel sometimes that everything was coming together in this book. Your story and, New and the story of New Jersey, which is the story of America in a certain way. Yeah, in a way, a companion to this book. It's really lectures I gave uh, at Princeton, uh, Democracy, Culture, and the Voice of Poetry. That's a prose book. And um, it's not in the least a memoir. So in a way, this book is to retell that book as a personal memoir.
Thank you all. And thank you, Joe. Many thanks. Thank you. And we will now schmooze and sign books. We will now schmooze and sign books.